Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Mineral Live. I'm Kevin Hardy, and I'm here with Walker Lee, uh, Jordan and I's adopted work son. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about tonneau covers. We have the, in an upside down configuration, uh, the uh, Cybertruck tonneau cover here. Off to our left here, we have the Rivian uh, Gen 1 version of their uh, power tonneau cover as well with the essentially slats and springs in the correct orientation this time. I think we had them upside down last time. And then obviously we have the, you know, the Cybertruck behind us. So, um, you know, Walker, you and I both have trucks. Sure. We both have tonneau covers. Uh, yours is a little bit more similar to this. Yep. If you want to kind of just go into the, like a brief overview of, you know, the, the Cybertruck system and then we'll kind of sure. we'll discuss a little bit. So. Sure. So I guess we could first compare the overall mechanism in which it uses to, to kind of roll itself up in a, in a stored state. So. What's different about the Cybertruck that we're looking at here versus the Rivian that we've looked at previously is that this would roll up. So in a closed state, it would be roughly an oval that we can look at on the vehicle. But that's the biggest difference I would say is that this one rolls up where the Rivian system was more of like a cartridge load, if you will. And so I think by nature of the decision they made to go that method, a lot of the, the complexity and the parts that we're looking at is basically a result of that decision. So when we're looking at the overall system, in comparison, this is comprised of, I think, 29 slats we can. So these are all single cell extrusions if we want to get up close. So in contrast to the Rivian system, they had, I think, three cell extrusions. So they basically made up what would be three of these combined. Yeah, we have a cross section here. So when you're looking at the overall length of these extrusions making up the tonneau cover, when you, I think we were kind of speaking beforehand that the amount of slats they had to do is partially just a result of the decision to do a, a roll-up method. Right. Once you start getting into having to have a required bend radius, you obviously need to break up these slats in order to get that diameter that you're looking for. So I think it's partly a result. It was a decision they made. And what we can talk about is some of the, the resulting outcomes of that decision. So it's a lot more parts, I would say, in comparison to the Rivian. Um, if we want to look at how the actual Rivian, how the Cybertruck system is being um, rolled up, they basically are relying on these multi-piece injection moldings to, to drive that. And we'll look at the, the motorized system on the vehicle that engages with that. But it's a bunch of extrusions spanning the length of the vehicle. And then on either end, we have these multi-piece injection moldings that are actually going to be driving that system. So I kind of have it separated here. Actually, when we first took this apart, it kind of fell apart. I was actually super surprised to see these as two separate pieces because yeah. they kind of look like a a drive wheel on a tank, actually this whole system kind of is very similar to a tank. We were, we were making some comparisons to that last time we were talking about the Rivian. Um, but um, it does make sense when you kind of think about it, right? So, you know, you can put these probably, you know, a hundred of these in a cavity, yep. offset them where the tool is kind of closing. And essentially, you, don't, you wouldn't have a part line. If we were to do this as one piece, you'd have a lot of tool complexity there, depending on its orientation, and then part lines on bearing surfaces. So it makes sense to see these as two yep. separate pieces. They just make a whole bunch of them all at once. So a little surprise, but it, again, from a manufacturing perspective, completely makes sense for it to be a separate piece. But you can see essentially on every one of these legs here, you know, the, the axle, we have a kind of a, a bearing itself and then these two rollers and then a dog leg that connects them and then this goes throughout. So Yeah, and I think the other thing worth mentioning on these parts themselves is if we look real closely, um, these are palm, at least this specific one called out. And that would be to be expected. The, the palm has a high lubricity. And so these pieces are going to be cycled over and over again. And so that uh, makes sense to choose that material for the kind of um, work that's being required of it. Yeah, it's a little expensive. Yep. And we see it oftentimes, like in ice vehicles, you'll see a palm all the time in fuel systems yep. because it has a lot of um, resistance essentially to various oils yeah. and things of that nature and essentially the, yeah. the hostile environment that you find in a fuel tank. Yeah, so. I think one of the things that, that you saw on the Rivian system was it hadn't been cycled a lot, but we saw a lot of wear and tear on the plastic components. So. Right. This would be why you would select this higher grade material is to avoid some of that wear and tear on the plastic part. Thanks to the Three Dimensional Services Group for sponsoring this video. Whether you're looking to source metal stamping, precision CNC machining, laser cutting, welded assembly, or plastic injection molding, the Three Dimensional Services Group should be the source to transform your EV, aerospace, appliance, or technology designs into reality while also providing a bridge to start of production. Hey boys and girls, I'm here with Dan and we're at um, Three Dimensional Services Group. And um, Dan, uh, this is pretty impressive. Why don't you give us a little background on, um, on what you guys do here? 
Okay, well, uh, the three-dimensional services group was founded by Douglas Peterson 31 years ago. Uh, we've grown into the world's largest, most capable, and most agile prototype and low-volume manufacturer. In essence, we're a job shop on steroids. We work with the world's most innovative companies to validate their designs, and then we're able to take our low-volume manufacturing processes and scale them across a massive amount of equipment to allow us to support volumes that a traditional prototype shop would never be able to support. Uh, we, we're always working with our clients to accelerate their product development type timelines and enable them to be as successful as possible by bringing their market or their products to market as quickly as possible. So coming over to the the R and T setup, um, we essentially have the the magazine or the cartridge, if you will, um, removed from the assembly itself. So it rides on this um, the carrier. You have the springs. There's two plates that the springs. Um, actuate against and they slide across the bottom of this carrier. They're missing somewhere. Um, but essentially all these slats sit in this magazine and you can kind of see right here um, that this is how it essentially feeds out like a Pez dispenser, um, the slats themselves. And then you push it back in and you can see the gear train portions with it are, are, are missing. Um, but it is a single motor on one side, much smaller than a Cybertruck. And then there is essentially one small drive rod um, that has a fair amount of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like slop? Not slop. Um, mm. There it is. Can't think of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, compliance. There, there we, we go. go. So that runs across, right? So they are bracing it, um, but it does have some compliance um, and wind up across the board. But, uh, you know, overall, that's kind of the, the, the basic functionality with it. It essentially is dispersing slots. These extrusions have only one seal per side in contrast to the Cybertruck. Uh, every, every joint has kind of a seal there. Um, and then it just rolls out and locks into place. Um, I should say slides out and locks into place itself. Yeah, I guess in comparison to the actual mechanism that's being driven um, here, we have, uh, again, I think this outer portion is an ex extrusion that we looked at and then over molded with Probably palm again, a similar material. I think it's just pressed and then they switch it in place. place. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so, uh, okay, yeah. So this is a, there is an insert, it is an overmold, and then this is insert and then swaged in place. A few <laughs> so, more operations. A few more operations. But um, I'm glad we cleared that up. Yeah, and again, we, we still haven't seen the version two of the system. You know, uh, here is kind of a section we have cut. I'd love to see, I, I'm hoping, you know, that they kind of have done something similar with these slats on the side, you know actual perforations through it with cogs that drive through it. Very similar to essentially how this is done on a Cybertruck. Um, do you want to go into the Cybertruck and kind of yeah. overlay this real quick? Um, let's see here. Let me put this back together. Um, but it, it's, you know, one of the things that I, I do find interesting, and obviously I find lots of things interesting, uh, <laughs> um, is both these vehicles, and it's, I mean, there's not many electric trucks, right? Yeah. But they've both favored from the get-go, essentially hard, lockable storage, right? Yep. So you have a, a similar tonneau cover on yours. <clears throat> and um, it's, you know, not integrated, never came from the factory, yep. you know? So you, know, you kind of, you give up a lot of bed space, right? Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it not being offered by an OEM when you're just adding an aftermarket to your own vehicle, it does eat into a significant amount of my bed space and just some of the design decisions had to be made to be adapted to multiple different vehicles. So it's just not as integral as you would see offered from an OEM like we see in both the Cybertruck and the Rivian. Yeah, so. it's pretty interesting. So I think, there's another one. Uh, <laughs> it just, uh, I don't know if it'll be a, oh God, uh, a trend that continues, right? Um, but lockable storage on EV trucks, uh, there, there seems to be a little bit of one. So if you want to kind of come around um, here as I continue to traverse and not fall into the Cybertruck. Oh, Alrighty. You can see essentially we have the extrusion that comes up from the side of the, the bed sail panel, a casting here at the corner, they're bolted together, and then another extrusion that's feeding into essentially the tunnel cover, um, I don't know, parking garage, whatever you want to call it. But you can see here the motor, which the motor gearbox and everything about this is significantly larger um, and essentially is redundant, if you will, 
um, in comparison to the Rivian R1T. So the motor size is, I don't know, what do you think, Walker? Four, four, four times yeah, the size, you know? Yeah, so the gearbox here, but part of this, the size of this is driven based off essentially how, you know, these dog bones, of course, because it's not in, I'm gonna be able to spin this, but essentially these are coming through here and then each of these sprockets would be interfacing here, but you get to see how deep this sprocket um, sits within relation to this overall track. And there's essentially no room for this to slip, you know, in contrast to the relatively shallow teeth that we saw on the R1T um, and the troubles that it had, despite the fact that like from a packaging perspective, I mean, you can see the entire R1T system would package roughly in here, yep. right? Um, and then this kind of continues up. Part of that is the decision to essentially have a, a unibody truck with these sail panels, you know, if we were to sprawl your um, tunnel cover out, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nearly as long, no. right? You know, because it's not running through, down, and up to the roof line of the vehicle and then coming back down. Yeah, they didn't take the straightest path, that's for sure. So, um, but that's like an architectural compromise. Yep. Yeah, so, that, um, but it is, there's a lot of complexity here and there's a lot of cost. Um, I'm, uh, maybe we'll do like a quick follow-up or I don't know, maybe Eric will tweet out something. A, a rough high level comparison, you know, between the two. Um, but it is, so far I've seen nothing major, right? As yeah. far as major issues that people have had with the system in contrast, unfortunately to the, the Rivian where uh, kind of early on, you know, people started having some problems with their system itself. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, whether you like the truck or not, it's iconic. And part of the, you know, that, that aspect is it's styling and frankly, the, the vault or the yeah. tonneau cover, you know, aspect of it and how it functions and the rigidity that is there yeah. as well. So, yeah. And I think it's unique in that it both different than other trucks. Like you were saying, it, it plays a significant role in the styling of the vehicle as well, well as aerodynamics, but it also has to live up to the durability requirements of the rest of the vehicle. So I right. think there's 300 pounds that it can withstand. So, Overall, there's a lot of requirements being driven into the system that, that makes it this complex. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen anything as far as like freezing conditions or anything like that, but I mean, we see the size of the powertrain, you know, with the, with the tunnel cover itself. So yeah. I, I do think it probably would be able to move relatively well through adverse conditions, you know, and things of that nature. Yeah. And actually, there you go. Yeah, while we're at the truck, maybe we can show this part. So this is, this lives separate from the actual tonneau cover. It latches on at the top here. And I think what's most unique about this is that if we come up close on this side, Eric, there's this little brush that's been slid across the, the extrusion and there's a little seal here as well. But I think we're under the impression that this would be kind of cleaning off that surface before it gets stored in that, that garage, I think that we called it. So this would help kind of keep some of the dirt and debris out of the system to keep it running smooth. I know that mine in particular gets pretty bogged down with a lot of dirt and debris in the area. And uh, sometimes I have to manually clear it up. So that would probably help that, that from happening. Yeah, so, um, I mean, that's, that's kind of it, right? There's, there is a lot of cost, there is a lot of complexity, but those are trade-offs for the styling of the vehicle and functional requirements, right? And then w regardless of what customer we have, wherever we're working, it's a constant battle all the time, right? Is we have to do this because of this requirement. And then, um, you know, we try to challenge that a lot with customers looking competitively across the, um, uh, the segments that they're in to see if they really need to be as stringent as possible um, or they currently are at. But that is one thing that I'm, I'm getting right now, at least from it is, you know, there, there is a lot of cost, there is a lot of complexity. I do think it'll probably work relatively well for people, yeah. um, you know, only time will tell, but some of that is just given the functional requirements that it, that it has, right? As far as its, it's uh, rigidity, the look of the vehicle, the style of the vehicle, the lines that it has to follow. Um, there's a lot of cost in studios, right? You know, that, and they, they want a vehicle to look a certain way, they want it to function a certain way. Um, that may not necessarily help with the vehicle itself, but that kind of makes it iconic, so. So the last thing, obviously the, the backlight glass here, it's not big, even if the tunnel cover is open. Um, but, uh, you know, when the tonneau cover is closed, granted there's cameras, uh, cameras do get dirty, um, and it's very difficult to see out the back, right? Uh, a lot of people criticize this truck essentially for being, I don't know, less work oriented. 
Uh, I myself kind of feel that way with respect to the bed profile as far as putting common accessories, salt spreader. If you really wanted to use it in a utility fashion, um, you're going to have to buy something, you know, as a bespoke to this vehicle. Um, but that is, you know, undoubtedly essentially a kind of a large deterrent, right? Yeah. Not a deterrent, but it is a compromise um, and a large one as far as outward visibility to the yep. rear of the vehicle. Um, I don't think, honestly, I've ever seen a backlight glass that short in Z height, frankly, ever. Like, yeah. This is Lamborghini Countach, you know, size. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and the Rivian actually packaged their tonneau cover in vehicle higher up, but yet it still looked like they had a bigger back glass. So, yeah. yeah. So, overall, it's been an interesting system to see. Um, I, I want to, you know, see the rest of it kind of come yeah. out so we can see just like from an overall weight perspective, how much more mass is in this system. And then eventually, obviously, how it rolls up in terms of cost. Yeah. I mean, um, I do think from the cost perspective, while it is complex and there's a lot of parts, a lot of what we're looking at is extrusion. So, and it's a lot of, well, it's a lot of parts. It's a lot of common part numbers, I would yep. say. And so yeah. in terms of extrusions, lower cost and, and a actually, lot of shared components. you can see components. that, Eric, through here, right? So just, they're late, probably laser etched, right? But yeah. essentially it is a lot of parts, but there are a lot of commonality between it. Yeah, so. it's really, uh, all the crossbars are common. All these little connecting pieces are common and then all the, the seals and the extrusions themselves are, are all common, so. I'd love to know if this is being partially in, um, automated or if this is yeah, essentially being- I wouldn't want to put together. You know, put together <laughs> by hand, so. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it for me. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I think so. So, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Obviously, they're, they're two very different systems. Hope we kind of conveyed the, the overall size and functionality of the Cybertruck system in contrast to the Rivian, which is extremely compact um, and, and relatively simple, obviously, in comparison to this. But um, thank you very much, and we appreciate it.